Adrenaline plays a vital role in your body, but chronically high adrenaline levels can lead to all kinds of nasty side effects like tense muscles, anxiety, and even panic attacks. The body needs certain nutrients and cofactors that help keep adrenaline in check, and they're often lacking in people with elevated levels. So let's go over them, talk about how exactly adrenaline functions, and what you can do to balance it naturally. Before that, let me quickly recap what adrenaline actually is. Adrenaline is both a hormone and a neurotransmitter, meaning it helps send messages between nerve cells like a neurotransmitter, but it also acts on tissue and organs like hormone. It is made mainly in the adrenal glands in response to stress. That's because it is crucial for the body's fight or flight response, which is our survival mechanism triggered during stressful situations. When it is released in large amounts, it boosts your heart rate, which then sends more blood to muscles and organs, helping your body react quickly. Adrenaline also causes your airways to open up and it stimulates the release of glycogen from the liver. This is done so you have better oxygen intake and a quick source of energy during a fight or flight situation. It also narrows blood vessels in non-essential areas like your skin and digestive system to redirect all that blood to more vital organs like your heart and muscles. Again, all of this is done to give you the best chance of survival in stressful situations. If your body senses a threat, more adrenaline will be produced and all body functions that allow you to quickly take action will be prioritized. For our ancestors, this usually meant either fighting or fleeing from something like a tiger. Of course, nowadays you don't need to face tigers and fight for survival on a daily basis, but that doesn't mean our adrenaline levels are lower than theirs. Quite the contrary, actually. That's because our body cannot distinguish between existential threats, like a dangerous animal, and more benign stress, like a deadline from work or an important project. While the work project definitely won't kill you, it still stresses you, which the body interprets as a threat, which in turn triggers the release of adrenaline. And because most of us are constantly thinking and worrying about things such as our health, work, and money, many of us are also adrenaline dominant. In that sense, adrenaline dominance and sympathetic dominance are very similar. So if you've watched one of my videos on the nervous system and its sympathetic branch, many of these health implications can also be applied to adrenaline dominance. Oftentimes, chronically elevated adrenaline is much more problematic than short bursts of it. So ironically, running from a tiger for five minutes, but then relaxing for the rest of the week is probably more healthy than the constant low-level stress and chronic adrenaline elevation that many of us experience in the modern world. Before I talk about what you can do to naturally lower adrenaline, let's quickly discuss how exactly it is made in the body. Understanding this biochemical process helps us calm it down later on. Okay, so again, most of your adrenaline is made in your adrenal glands, which are disc-shaped organs on top of each kidney. The process of adrenaline synthesis is the same as that of dopamine, because dopamine is a direct precursor to adrenaline. Basically, the body takes the amino acid tyrosine and converts it into L-dopa and then dopamine. To get adrenaline, the dopamine needs to be converted into neuroadrenaline, which can then finally be converted into adrenaline. Neuroadrenaline and adrenaline are very similar, with the only difference being a methyl group that adrenaline has. Because of the additional methyl group, they stimulate different receptors in the body, but both are mostly related to your stress response. Also, just for your information, adrenaline is also often called epinephrine, same with neuroadrenaline, which can also be called neuroepinephrine. These are just different names for the same things. Great, now that you know how exactly adrenaline is made, how do you naturally reduce it? I'm not going to talk about active relaxation in this video, since that is a topic for a different video. We will only go over nutrients found in foods or supplements that can help you biochemically lower your adrenaline levels. Basically, nutrients can be used in one of two ways. One, we can decrease the building blocks your body uses to make adrenaline and increase nutrients that block it. Or two, we can influence how adrenaline is used up by your body. This is done by increasing adrenaline reuptake, so how much and how fast the neurotransmitter is reabsorbed into neurons and therefore no longer available to your nervous system. Let's go through both strategies and explain the key nutrients involved. 
Let's start with nutrients that block adrenaline's function. These include most calming nutrients like magnesium, calcium, GABA, zinc, and lithium. For example, magnesium relaxes the muscles and nervous system, and it helps block adrenaline and glutamate, which are both excitatory neurotransmitters. On top of that, it also increases the function of GABA, which I will talk about in a second. Calcium acts together with magnesium to calm the nervous system and inhibit too much nerve signaling. Lastly, GABA is a neurotransmitter itself that can also be supplemented directly. It is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the nervous system, so it acts as a natural break to all kinds of stimuli. When GABA binds to its receptors, it makes it harder for these neurons to be stimulated. This helps to calm your body and lowers the effect adrenaline has on you. Other important nutrients include the B vitamins as well as choline and inositol, which, if deficient, will stress your body. So they're not necessarily calming nutrients, but when you don't have enough, it stresses your body and can also spike adrenaline. Also, choline is necessary for the production of acetylcholine, the main neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system, so the calming branch of your nervous system. Next to these calming nutrients, there are also adaptogens like Bacopa monieri, ashwagandha, and others. These are usually plant compounds that contain chemicals which calm the brain and help regulate adrenaline. Reaction to these adaptogens is very individual, so you probably have to try out a few to see if and how they work for you. My personal favorite for lowering adrenaline is Bacopa monieri, but again, this is different for everyone. In terms of reducing adrenaline cofactors, the most important one you need to look at is copper. Even though copper is essential for many bodily functions, when copper levels become too high and your body isn't able to get rid of the excess copper, it will build up in places where it's not supposed to be, at least not in these high quantities. The result is copper toxicity, especially when the excess copper is not properly bound to carrier proteins and becomes biounavailable. Because copper triggers the conversion of dopamine to adrenaline, people with too much copper are almost always also adrenaline dominant. So one key way of reducing adrenaline is to reduce your copper load and bring it back into healthy levels. I have a bunch of videos on this on my channel and please know one thing. You can follow all the tips in this video, but if you don't address your copper issues, it probably won't help much. That's how powerful of a nutrient copper is. It can not only lead to adrenaline dominance, but it also excites nerve cells. So you constantly feel on edge even if there are no stressors around. Okay, now that we have that covered, what about the second aspect? So increasing adrenaline reuptake. This is where methylation comes into play. Methylation describes the addition of a methyl group, which is a small molecule made of one carbon and three hydrogen atoms. These methyl groups need to be added to other molecules in your body, like neurotransmitters, hormones, and even your DNA, so that it can be used properly. What often happens in high adrenaline people is that the genes responsible for adrenaline reuptake are underactive. So even if you produce low amounts of adrenaline, if it doesn't get reabsorbed by the neurons, it will be active for longer than it should. Such people are called overmethylators because their bodies produce too many methyl groups. And because methylation silences gene function, their adrenaline reuptake genes are constantly being silenced. Alongside high adrenaline, overmethylators also tend to have high levels of the other key neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine. This neurotransmitter imbalance can lead to ADHD, irritability, and the like. Overmethylators also experience a range of other common symptoms, like perfume sensitivity, low histamine, and high artistic ability, even though they tend to be underperformers in a traditional academic environment. Bringing their methylation down is often a long-term endeavor, and it can take several months. You do that through nutrients that lower methylation, like vitamin B3, B9, and B12. These are all either methyl reducers, so they use up methyl groups, or they promote histone acetylation, which is basically the opposite of methylation. So instead of silencing genes, it activates them. I have a video on overmethylation that covers all this in much more detail and also explains how exactly these nutrients downregulate your methylation. Definitely check it out if you suspect yourself of being an overmethylator. 
Perfect. Now that you have a better understanding of how exactly adrenaline works and what nutrients influence it, you also have a better idea of how to decrease it naturally. Before I end this video, one more important disclaimer. Obviously, none of this is medical advice. And if you suffer from adrenaline dysregulation, always consult a specialized doctor. This video is for educational purposes only. As you can see, nutritional psychiatry is a crazy rabbit hole where once you dive in, you will be surprised by all the research that has been done on nutrients and neurotransmitters. We actually have a very good understanding of how exactly vitamins, minerals, and amino acids affect your brain. But the difficult part is just seeing through all the vast amount of research and not missing the forest for the trees. I do my best to explain everything for beginners on my channel, so make sure to check out my other videos if this type of stuff interests you.